Custom events in JavaScript are amazing at implementing things like double clicking or swipe based gestures, but they can also be used to communicate between two different parts of your application incredibly easily. And best of all, creating and using a custom event is about as easy as it gets in JavaScript. I'm gonna show you absolutely everything you need to know about them in this quick video. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And today we're gonna to be talking all about custom elements. And to get started, I just have a simple script tag being linked in this HTML and this HTML has one button. On the right, you can see the button and the console for this page. Then inside of our script.js, we have nothing. Now, in order to create and use custom events, it's as simple as calling new event. And this is just a constructor. And inside of it, you can pass it a name and then some options. First, we're gonna look at just passing it a name and then we're gonna look at the options next. So you can give it any name you want. We're just gonna call this my custom event. And we can set that to a variable such as my event, just like that. So now we have created an event. And if I save, you'll notice nothing happens because all we've done is created an event. We haven't actually triggered the event and we aren't listening for this event at all. So let's listen for this event on, let's say our document. We'll say document.addEventListener and we're gonna add an event listener for my custom event. And whatever you call your event is the same thing that you wanna to listen to inside of your add event listener. Then we can take in that event object. And for now, all I'm gonna do is console log that event object out. Now, if we save again, you'll notice nothing happens. And that's because we've created an event. We've created a way to listen for that event, but we haven't actually triggered that event yet. In order to actually trigger the event, all we need to do is take any element we want. For our case, we're gonna use document and you're gonna call a message called dispatch event. And you just pass it in the event you wanna dispatch. What this is going to do is it's gonna take our custom event. It's going to dispatch that. And if we're listening to it, which we are, it is going to run that code. Now, when I save, you can see down here, it prints out information about my event. And you can see there's actually a lot of default information that you get. Probably the most important information that you're going to see inside of here is you're going to get a bunch of information for the options that we can set. So bubbles, cancelable, composed. Those are options we can change within our event. You're also going to see here if the default has been prevented. Have we tried to cancel the event? And then most importantly down here, you're going to get the target. That's the actual thing that the event is being triggered on. And then finally, we have is trusted at the very top here. If this is set to false, it means it's created via this dispatch event. And if it's set to true, then that means this event was triggered by a user clicking. So like if you listen to a click event, which I can do here, I can say click. And if I click up here and we look inside of here, you can see is trusted is true because that's related to a UI event that the user actually triggered. Let's just bring it back here to my custom event. And we'll look down at the very bottom. You'll also see timestamp, which is when the event occurred and the type, which is just the name we specified for our event. This is really great if you just want to have like really basic custom events so you can send information and you can receive it with this add event listener. But what if you want to customize it a little bit? We can come into here and we can add some properties into this customization. The first one is going to be bubbles. And this determines whether or not the event is going to bubble up. By default, it is set to false, but we can change it to true if we want. And if you're unfamiliar with bubbling and event propagation, I have a full video covering it. I'll link in the cards in the description for you. And I'll also put it at the end of this video because it's a really important follow-up. So next property that we want to talk about is cancelable. So if this is set to true, it means you can actually cancel the event. So like a click event, for example, you can cancel so that it no longer triggers things like link tags moving onwards. So if you really wanna cancel it, you can. But for the most part, you don't really have to worry too much about this cancelable property because you're not really doing a default thing with your events. But by default, this is set to false, so you can change it to true if you want. Now, the final property I wanna talk about is composed. And this one's a little bit tricky. Composed essentially means that this event is able to propagate up through your shadow DOM. So if you're using like custom elements and you have some shadow DOM and you want to have an event trigger inside that shadow DOM and then propagate up outside of the shadow DOM, you would need to set composed to true. By default, it's set to false. This is something you generally don't have to worry about unless you're working with custom elements and the shadow DOM. And then in that case, most likely you want it to propagate up or in some cases, you maybe only want it to stay within that custom element, so you'd set this to false, which is the default. Honestly, it doesn't matter either way. But for the most part, you're not gonna really mess too much with these properties. You may mess with the bubble as one, but the other two, you're not gonna use that often. Well, let's take a look at what happens if you do have a cancelable event. So we're gonna say cancelable true inside of here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add another event listener on our button. Whoops, button right here. And all I wanna do is I wanna say default prevented. I just want to check to see what the value for this property is. And we're going to do it inside of our document event listener, and we're going to do it inside of our button event listener. And this is a cancelable event. So by default, if we just save this real quick and I click on our button, oh, and I need to make sure I get a reference to our button. So we can just say document dot query selector our button. There we go. So now if I just change this to dispatch this on the actual button itself, you should see 
that we get is saying console log button, and we want to make this bubble. So we're going to say oops, bubbles true. That way it bubbles up to our document as well. So now you can see it's going inside of our button and it's going inside of our document. It's rendering on both of these. So we have our event listener going on both, and on both of them, prevent defaulted or default prevented is set to false. If we come in here and we just say e.prevent default, like you would do if you have like a link or a form submitting, and we do that in our button, you're going to notice now this is set to true. And if we do it after that log, you can see it's false when it gets into the button. And then when it goes to the document, this is set to true because we prevented the default in our button. Well, if we change cancelable to false, now you can see no matter what we do, if we try to prevent the default, it'll still say false because this is an event that cannot be canceled. So you can use this to like really fine tune your events to say, hey, you know what, if we click inside the button or if the button dispatches the event, you know, we can cancel it in the button and then that way the document doesn't listen to it. So that's an important thing to consider, but for the most part, you really don't have to worry about it too much. Now this covers most of your use cases when it comes to events, but what happens if you wanna pass custom data along with your event? Well, to do that, you need to change your constructor here. You want to call new custom event instead of new event. And nothing else changes. The name stays the same. All the properties inside of here change the same. We just add one additional property, which is called detail. And detail can be anything you want. Generally, it's going to be an object with all the information you care about. So for example, we can just say like, hello, and we can pass in some text such as world, just like that. So now if I save and we dispatch our event and I look at the e.detail and I just get rid of all the rest of this code that we don't need, you can see that detail is an object which has the key hello and the value world. So this is really great if you need to pass data from one place to another using an event, you're going to use a custom event. Otherwise, if you don't care about passing custom data, you can just use a normal event. For the most part though, you're probably gonna be using a custom event. Now that covers like most of the use cases of events, but how exactly would you go about implementing and using these custom events in a real world example? In our case, I'm gonna implement double click. So when we click on our button twice within quick succession, it's going to trigger a double click event. So we're gonna have an event, we're gonna call it double click. And one important thing to consider when you're naming your events is what happens if in the future, the browser implements their own double click event. Well, we don't wanna have a clash with them. So generally when I create custom events, I have some kind of prefix that I put at the front. So for example, I just put the text custom with a colon, or if you're in a project, just put the name of your project right here, followed by a colon. And this will kind of help you know when you're reading your code, okay, this is a custom event, it's not an actual JavaScript event. And if in the future, JavaScript implements their own double click event, you don't accidentally clash with that and have issues due to that. You just have this custom event that's completely separate from anything that JavaScript implements. So now we have this, let's just print inside of here, double click because anytime we double click on our button, we wanna run this function. So how would we go about doing that? Well, we can add another event listener to listen for clicks. We can just come in here and say click, which is gonna take in an event. And what I wanna do is I wanna say, hey, you know what? If this max double click time, this is gonna be the maximum time between our clicks. We're gonna say 500 milliseconds. So if we click the button twice within 500 milliseconds, then it's going to be considered a double click. And inside of here, all I want to do is I want to get the time between clicks. So we can say const time between clicks. And to get that, we can take our timestamp, which is the current time of our event. And we can subtract the time since our last click. And we're just going to save that in a variable. And by default, we're going to set it to zero. Then we can say, hey, if our time between clicks is greater than our max double click time, well, what we want to do is do nothing because this means it's taken too long. Essentially, the time between our clicks is longer than a normal double click. So what I want to do is I want to take my last click time. I want to set it to my timestamp and then return. So this is just saying, hey, you know what? If it's been too long, reset our last click time to the current click. That way, the next time we click, we can do this check again. Otherwise, if we have not exceeded that time, we've clicked twice within 500 milliseconds, then what I want to do is I want to create a new event. We're going to call this a double click event, which is going to be a new custom event. And this new custom event we called double click with that prefix of custom. And inside of here, I want this to work just like a normal click event. So a normal click event will bubble. So we're gonna say bubbles true. It is cancelable, so we're gonna say cancel true. Whoops, true, just like that. And also it is composed, so we're gonna set that to true. And then finally, we're gonna put some custom detail in here. We're gonna get the time between clicks and we're gonna pass that up into this button here. And then all we need to do is we just need to dispatch that event. So we're gonna say double click event then we're going to reset our last click time to zero. And one important thing to do is instead of using button here, we can just say e.target. And that's just going to make sure it dispatches the event on whatever we're currently clicking on. So if we're clicking on the button, it's going to dispatch the event to the button. That's a really neat trick right there. So now let's save. And if I click this twice back to back, you can see it prints out double click. But if I click it once, 
wait a while and then click again, you can see it doesn't print out anything new. And we can also get the time between clicks by just getting the detail object here and getting the time between clicks. So now when I click it twice, you can see there's 113 milliseconds between my clicks. If I do it again, there's 141 milliseconds. If I take too long, you can see it no longer prints out. Now, one of the places these events shine the most is with touch-based gestures. So if you wanna understand how to do touch-based events in JavaScript, I'm gonna have a video linked over here, as well as that video covering event propagation that's linked over here as well. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.